Welcome to the Petropolis Podcast. I'm your host, Taz Latifi. Our guest today is Philocentis. She's joining us again to talk about this Purina affair. Phyllis is a food safety expert and also the author of two books relevant to food safety. One is Tainted, which is about the human food side. And she touches a little bit on the pet food side in that book, From Farm Gate to Dinner Plate, 50 Years of Food Safety Failures. And her most recent book is called Toxic, right behind me, From Factory to Food Bowl, Pet Food is a Risky Business. Uh, Phyllis is an expert in this segment, so it's really important for us to capture what is happening right now with Purina and the information that is all over social media, YouTube. Dr. Judy Morgan has been speaking eloquently and being very informative about the information she's getting Susan Thixton, Truth About Pet Food, has brought forth some information about what's happening in the reports she's getting from pet owners. I really wanted to get an expert in food safety to come here today to tell us some more about what she thinks may be happening. There's no inside information here, but she, she can give us some perspective as to how things work with the FDA and the process that it takes to go from the consumer complaints to the recalls. And it's such a gray area. And I wanted an expert to touch on this. Obviously, there's a lot of information on Dr. Judy's site, Rachel Fusaro, who is an influencer on YouTube and TikTok, talks about all this. There's a lot of information. So without further ado, let's welcome Phyllis Entis. Hi, Phyllis. How are you? I'm fine. Thanks, Taz. Thanks for inviting me. How are you doing? I'm excited to talk to you. I really want to find out what you think is happening with all these pets becoming sick. It's all been coming to a head in the last six weeks. I got a message via social media from someone who was in this group, saving pets one pet at a time. And this was right around Christmas. And she said, you really should do a live and talk about what's going on with Purina and animals dying. And then on January 5th, Dr. Judy Morgan put out a video on YouTube talking about her findings and the reports from Susan from Truth About Pet Food. And again, these are all consumer reports that are coming to them because they are very outspoken about whole foods, natural foods. So that was on January 5th. It was on, it was on YouTube. And I've just been following it. And every day since then, I've been watching Purina's page to see what's going on. On January 11th, Purina reported that they thought that everybody was making a bigger deal of this than it was. So I want you to give me some feedback as to the gray areas and the reporting. When can we find out what, what is going on? Oh, that's the million dollar question. I've been spending a fair bit of time keeping an eye on the Saving Pets group on Facebook, and I've been encouraging people to report their issues to the FDA because that's what needs to happen in order to get things moving. Social media is great for spreading the word, but for things to come to a head and for any proper investigation to go on, the FDA needs to get involved and the best way to get them involved is for them to receive complaints and preferably complaints from people who have leftover food that the FDA can then test to try and find out what is going on. So I posted on this initially, I think it was around January 4th or 5th, I forget now when my first post came out. I know it was very early in the new year. And it went absolutely viral because people were trying to find out what was going on. I've been in touch with the FDA on several occasions. I have a couple of very, very reliable, very down-to-earth contacts there who do the media relations for the Center for Veterinary Medicine. The situation at this point, as best I know, is the FDA has received quite a few reports including from people who have food available for testing. 
I'm aware personally of one person who I helped make the contact with the FDA who has residual food in an open bag. And I also saw on Saving Pets, another pet owner posted that they were in contact with the FDA and with the Texas state people and that the FDA was going to be coming and picking up their food. So we're at the stage now where the FDA has suspect food that they're going to be able to test. There's a, there's a fairly standard process that, that they'll go through. First off, they need to receive the complaints, as I said, and we can talk about how to file a complaint separately. Once they see the complaints, they review them for completeness. Obviously, someone who, sim who simply says, well, I fed my dog or cat this particular food. I don't have the batch number. I don't remember what the variety of food is, but my dog got sick after I ate the food. That's not a complaint that the agency can do a lot with other than simply add to the numbers. The really gold standard complaints are I fed my dog or cat this particular food. I have a veterinary report with blood work and any other results, and I have leftover food. Would you like some of it? That's, that's kind of the magic words. And of course, you're gonna get everything in between, and a lot of the in-between information is also useful, whether or not there are veterinary reports available. I wanted to ask you what that veterinary report would show if there is a problem. It, it would show, first of all, that there was an issue in terms of, for example, abnormal blood work. High white cell counts would be an indication, for example, of an inflammation or an infection. There are enzyme levels that relate to liver function. There are a range of things that can be interpreted to help direct an investigation. I think back to the pentobarbital case with Evangers back a number of years ago, where the family who had the, I think it was five or six dogs who got sick and one of them died, they had a necropsy. They were able to recover pentobarbital from the stomach contents of the dog, in addition to from the leftover can of food. So a, a veterinary report a necropsy, these things really help direct an investigation into the tracks most efficiently. Again, not having that shouldn't deter somebody from making the complaint. Yeah. Okay. So if the animal is just having, just having diarrhea or avoiding their food, should the pet owner be forcing them to eat those food? I know on one of the um, videos, Dr. Judy had said, don't doctor it up, take the food away. Take the food don't away. If you, think, if you think the food is an issue, don't try and make it more palatable, change to something else. And if in changing to something else, you see a change in your pet's health or behavior or attitude towards the food, that in itself is an indicator. Purina is a big company and they have various brands. Are they going to be looking at their whole uh, organization, their whole production uh, process, or do they just look at the brands that are coming in with the most complaints? I think what they're going to look at, and this is again based on what's happened in the past, is they are going to try and zero in, for starters, on where the food was made. They're going to look to see whether all of the complaints relate to food that was manufactured at a specific Purina location. Because Purina has, for pro-plan pro kibble alone, Purina has something like four or five manufacturing locations. If all of the all or almost all of the complaints key into one manufacturing location, then the FDA would key on that location first and would look not only at the pro plan brand, but would look at whatever else was manufactured at that same location, just as part of their 
normal process of uh, investigating. It's a hell of a process. It's a long process. It's a long process. It can be speeded up or slowed down depending on the level of cooperation from the company. What do you think about the level of cooperation from the company right now, as of now? Well, as of now, the company is saying, what? Us? No, this is all rumors. What they're saying behind the scenes to at least a couple of pet owners who have complained directly to the company is, well, we're not assuming any liability. This wasn't our fault, but we'd be very happy to give you $300 just for your for your trouble. Or in another case, another pet owner who posted again on Saving Pets, they offered to pet her, to pay her veterinary bills even while denying any responsibility. So it depends on who they're talking to. In their statement, they seem very confident that their pet food is not responsible. For yes, a I read the statement. How can they be so confident without really providing any data? Meanwhile, the pet owners are challenged with the task of proving them wrong instead of them saying, here, we have the data, we're testing everything. Well, they're not obliged to release any data, not even to the FDA under at, at this stage of the game. At this stage. At this stage. If the F, and, and, and this, gets, this gets complicated. Yeah. But basically, it's the see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil situation. The FDA has a process called the Reportable Food Registry. In theory, a company is legally obliged to notify the registry, to, to submit a registry report on any food, and I have the guidance document here and I'm reading this, the, requires a responsible party to file a report through the electronic portal when there is a reasonable probability that the use of or exposure to an article of food will cause serious adverse health consequences or death to humans or animals. And they have a 24-hour window in which to do so. Wait, what, from 24 hours from when? From when, when they determine that they have okay. a food. So, so and that's the key. If they don't test, then they don't have a problem food. So they don't have to test. Are you no. saying that they don't have to test? If these, these complaints have been coming in for weeks... And they put out this statement. And by, by the way, this statement was put out January 11th, and it's dated January 5th. Which I was a little, I was taken aback because I've been on their site daily looking to see since January 5th, rather, when I saw Dr. Judy Morgan's video. That's when I said, you know, let me just follow this. I literally have their website up on my screen. So, Every day I search through, no comments. And then I see this after tons of posts on social media. I said, okay, here's Purina's post. It was the afternoon of January 11th, but it's post dated January 5th. That makes no sense to me either. Well, that makes two of us. But you're the expert. <laughs> <laughs> It's quite possible that their original draft message had a January 5th date on it. And by, and by the time their their various legal teams got through with it, it was January 11th before it actually got posted. And they never changed yeah. the date. I, I give them the benefit of the doubt on that, but I don't know. Of course, we should give them the benefit of the doubt. After all, they are Nestle, Purina. So, so they have a little bit of a history of that initial denial. A lot of companies do. They're not alone. Darwin's, I don't want to just put it on the big companies, Darwin's, Avengers, they all go into the state of denial and until it just becomes untenable for them. So during this period, the FDA is doing their 
work in gathering information and pets are still getting sick and dying if the pet owners are not as aware. Either not as aware or don't want to rely on social media information. Oh. I received a number of comments on my original post, a number of comments from pet owners who had problems, a number of other comments from pet owners who said, I've been feeding this product for years and I'm still feeding the product and my dogs or cats are fine. And this can happen because in a, especially in something like a dry food, you don't get an even distribution of either a biological or a chemical contaminant uniformly through a batch. It's going to be heavier in some areas than others. So it could very well happen that some people have just gotten the bad bags, however many there, there are, and there obviously seem to be a lot. Hmm. Um, but the FDA is kind of on the horns of a dilemma. And, and I'm, I'm sort of extrapolating again from previous experience with, with other issues. They are aware that there's something going on. They are looking into it, but they can't really say anything publicly until it's evidence-based. And by evidence-based, they need to be able to say, we have examined this product and we have found X, whether that X is an, a natural toxin, like a mycotoxin or heavy metal or something microbiological or whatever the case may be. They can't just come out and say, oh, we're looking at this thing and we've had so many complaints from consumers, but we don't really know what's going on yet, but we're looking at it. Uh, that they can't put out a public statement like that because then company is going to be very rightly upset at being maligned with no with no backup. And if it should turn out that this is correlation without causation, mm -hmm. then the FDA loses its credibility both yeah. with the public and with the industry. So they are going to be working hard to try and find a cause of the problem and whether they do the testing first or whether they test and go into the production plant concurrently i don't know sometimes they will do sometimes they will if they think there's something that they need to hit very hard they'll at the same time that they're waiting for test results they will in any case do a plant visit okay but again that it that depends from case to case it depends on how much information they have on hand and what kind of reaction they're getting because I'm, I'm sure by now they will have been in touch with purina you know in their statement purina is essentially telling pet owners to ignore the information that yeah. susan thixton uh, from uh, truth about pet food dr judy morgan and uh, Saving Pets have put out there. And this is all coming from consumers. They're not pulling this out of the air. They are getting feedback from consumers who have their own history with their pets getting sick. Yes. And they're doing it on their own time, on their own dime. So Purin is essentially saying, ignore these things. Mm -hmm. We are great. We are okay. There's nothing wrong. No animals being harmed by consuming our foods. So with that said, it takes a long time for this process to happen. I mean, we, we had Beneful years ago where there yeah. were problems and it took almost two years for the recall to actually happen. It's a long process. And during this time, unless someone's constantly on top of it, like consumer groups, like Saving Pet, then animals may get very sick with mm -hmm. pet owners not knowing. It's irresponsible. Why wouldn't they just put a statement out? We're looking into this. We don't know. Instead of being so cocksure that their products are not the cause of any problems. I don't, I, don't, I don't have an answer to that. 
I don't so frustrating. It's very frustrating. The process can be long and it's especially a longer process if if a lab doesn't know what it's looking for. And I think back to the melamine in pet foods from so many years ago where animals were getting sick and this was especially cats and the FDA and the other labs in its in its network of cooperating labs couldn't find anything. They, they were looking for everything they could think of, but it was only when somebody figured out what they had to look for, which was the melamine, that things started to happen. You can't, you can't analyze for something. You can't just sort of put a piece of food into this magic black box and it will tell you absolutely everything that's there. You have to say, is there any aflatoxin there? Is there high level of copper? Is there penetram, which is another mycotoxin? Is there pentobarbital? Is there this? Because there are different tests for these different items. You can't just say, here's a black box, give me a profile of everything that's in that piece of food, and then we'll figure out what the problem is. It, it took somebody finding that first bit of melamine, that first piece of the puzzle, for the puzzle to be solved. So it's it's not it's not an easy process. And that was part of the problem with Beneful. They didn't know what they were looking for. And in fact, never found the actual cause. Same thing with the jerky treats. They didn't know what they were looking for and never did find the actual cause. They found the correlation. But not the cause. But not the cause. And it's finding the cause that that really makes a difference to speeding up the process. Once they have the cause, once they know what they're looking for, then they can track back, find out where it's come from. Recently, we've had Mid America Foods, we've had the Hills Vitamin D, Blue Ridge Beef. As far as sourcing goes, does the FDA have to go through who they're sourcing their products from and connect the dots. Similar recalls coming from sources that are supplying these manufacturers or similar issues that have happened in the past. It seems like they do a hell of a lot of an investigation. I, I want to give them a little bit of credit here <laughs> for the work that they do. I've, I've got to tell you, my contacts at the FDA tear their hair out sometimes because they they know what's going on at the lab level which of course they can't share with me because i'm because of their confidentiality requirements but they know what's going on inside and then they hear all of the complaints from the outside no, the fda isn't doing anything they are doing a heck of a lot they try to correlate but again they were they rely a lot on the companies being forthcoming with information when they go in to do an inspection. So let's say you have a company that is on the receiving end of an inspection for whatever reason. Inspector comes in. In theory, under the Food and Drug Act and under the Food Safety Modernization Act, an inspector is has the right to take photographs to document their findings has the right to examine documents, has the right to take copies of things, has the right to do all of these things. The inspector goes into a plant, takes out his, his or her camera as going on. Sorry, we don't allow photographs in the plant. Well, I do have the right to take photographs. Sorry, we don't allow it, company policy. Very well, I'll put that down as a refusal in my report. But if they're allowed, they're allowed. That makes no sense. Well, it means that the inspector has two choices. The inspector can proceed with the inspection or the inspector can suspend, go and get a court order to require. Oh, my God. So, so there's these delay so tactics. Practically speaking, practically speaking, if an inspector encounters a refusal, and there have been refusals to show the copies of consumer complaints that the company has received. There have been refusals to supply the sources of ingredients 
there have been refusals to supply the formulas for ingredients. In one of the in one of the investigations over the last couple of years, it was one of the large company investigations. The FDA wanted to know which ingredients went into which foods so that they could evaluate which of that company's foods were potentially subject to recall. The company refused. Sorry, proprietary information. So, Is this mostly this, this kind of pushback is this more on the pet food side versus uh, do you see it more on the pet food side than the human side the human side uh, when i read your book tainted it seemed like people were more forthcoming on the human side i think Not people so were a little bit more forthcoming on the human side but i'd hate to generalize i have seen because i I've, I've read a lot of the establishment inspection reports which is which is where you see the nitty-gritty details Right. It really varies from company to company. And okay. uh, it, it's it's hard to generalize and say, well, this is more of a pet food issue or this is more of a human food issue. Uh, it happens on both sides. So when there's thievery and people don't want to be found out, they're just going to hide. Well, I, I think what the industry has learned is that there's no penalty for lack of cooperation on these issues. Oh, man, wouldn't that be great if there was a penalty for lack of cooperation, but then you have to find them guilty first. And exactly. Um, exactly. Yeah, so it's such a it's such a convoluted process. I have a feeling it could be simplified, but the corporations don't want it to be simplified. Are there symptoms that these animals could be having based on the potential pathogens that they're consuming in their food? Are there specific symptoms associated with salmonella versus E. coli versus shiga that the pet consumer could have a better awareness of? Well, uh, as far they as- They to do their own testing. They could ask for it possibly. They can ask for it. It can be expensive depending on their veterinarian and their lab. Symptoms of the, the microbial pathogens would primarily be the gastrointestinal symptoms, the nausea, the vomiting, the diarrhea, sometimes bloody diarrhea, especially if it's a shiga type thing. But those things in the absence of other symptoms would, would tend to point to bacterium of some sort or possibly a parasite like a giardia, but giardia would not tend to be something you would associate with. That's more of an environmental or water issue. What I've been seeing in the reports on uh, saving pets, there have been animals who've had seizures. There's been some rapid weight loss, muscle weakness, excessive urination. There's been some indications of jaundice. Now these are these are more pointing towards potential chemical or toxin type of situations. Seizures, for example, some mycotoxins can cause seizures. That would be something I would imagine the FDA labs will be looking at. Heavy metals, excess of heavy metals can cause seizures. Where would excess of heavy, heavy metals come in when it comes to food processing? Well, the foods that are fish-based could potentially have something like mercury in some of the fish. For example, mm -hmm. depending on what's in some of the ingredients, it, it could come in from one of the ingredients, lead poisoning, lead from something. I, it's hard to say, again, until there are actual test results that the FDA has that it can key in on, okay, we have found, for example, lead. Let, now we found it in the finished product. Let's check the ingredients. Mm -hmm. Where might it have come from? So they have to trace that back. They have to trace back. And we're seeing that on the human food side. I don't know if you've been following the cinnamon applesauce pouch oh, yeah. situation. Yes. And this was a case of very high levels of lead contamination. And the FDA traced back to the manufacturer 
found that it was coming from cinnamon. Mm -hmm. I also found chromium, by the way, that was in one of their most recent uh, update reports. So again, they knew what they were looking for mm -hmm. because they received reports of sick children who had lead poisoning and who had been and fed. there's still more of those those and there's still more of those on the market yeah it's not yeah. it's not fully resolved yet yes yeah. so they again they knew what they were looking for they could key in on it relatively quickly and relatively precisely well, how do you clear out the market of this because like with the baby product stuff for humans right you would think that people would be more aggressive versus pets but the dollar stores they still have these things on the shelves when there's a recall and the fda oversees the recall process and to the extent that uh, either fda or their state partners will do random visits to some retail locations to see if there's still stuff on the shelves. Uh, they will also, and again, back to consumers, if a consumer goes into a store and happens to see a product that they know is recalled still on the shelf, they, should they can call to the FDA. And that goes for either human or pet products. It's essentially, the the consuming public is the early warning system. But then you have brands putting down the consumers for making complaints and saying that they're creating a... Panic. Yeah. It bothers me that Purina is saying this, that they're creating panic. And they're claiming that these consumers are being irresponsible. And they're the ones causing further distress when, in fact, they're just trying to alert the public. It's like, you know, when Donald Trump said, you know, yes, <laughs> the <floor laughs> <was bleached. laughs> research bleach to help clear out COVID. You know, it's that same concept. Mm -hmm. It's that lack of responsibility from the big manufacturers. How could this be? How could the FDA, how could the government allow this with? Uh, these organizations? Because the government does not have an, enough People? funding to cope with the size of the industry it's trying to regulate. Bottom line. So we have a Congress that is trying to cut back government funding. Mm -hmm to levels that are below pre-COVID. And the regulatory agencies, whether you're talking about the FDA or the EPA or the regulatory portions of the USDA, are year after year after year having to do more with less. Now, I... I've worked for government. I was with Health Protection Branch, which was then Canada's FDA for seven years. Right. I saw what was going on on the inside and I was very fortunate. I was there in the heyday of when there was money to actually do the job. I'm talking about the 1970s. In the 1970s, the FDA had a lab in Minneapolis that was dedicated to surveys and research on food issues, on microbiological issues. It was the National Center for Microbiological Investigation, if I remember correctly. And they would get some inspectors would pick up samples from all over the country and send them. They'd have special projects. Okay, this year we are going to see what the story is with frozen foods, what are the microbiological risks? And they would survey, they would, they would get a couple of thousand samples from across the country sent to that one lab for analysis. And they would come up with a report, okay, this is the total microbial count range 
we found E. coli in X percentage of the samples. We found staph in Y percentage. We found salmonella. And based on those data, the FDA would determine whether they needed to do more detailed surveillance of a particular sector. Well, that lab disappeared in one of the budget cuts. Here totally. When is Purina obliged to actually go to the FDA and say, here, here, we actually have a problem? Where when do they if when and when if and when Purina does testing and discovers a dangerous level of whatever the material is in its finished product. At that point, the clock starts ticking and it has 24 hours to file that report with the FDA. But that's the if and the if and when is what I'm confused about. Correct. They're not obliged to test. They're not obliged to look for that particular item. How much pressure do they need to get from the consumers to force their hand? It does it happen that way? Is is that an option? Well, if everybody stops feeding Purina products, then they will lose money, and that's their pressure. It's the financial pressure. I know there have been talks about trying to do a class action suit. That is not the answer. I've I've, I've got no problem with people doing that and getting compensation at some point down the road but that does not put the pressure on the here and now. And there have been so many. I mean, Beneful, the jerky, they, they, they pay out money every couple of years. And again, unless you have the documentation that it really was the cause of the problem, the case is going to be thrown out. And that has happened where consumers have filed a class action uh, against pet food companies for whatever the case may have been. And I, I, I forget now which the cases were. And the judges looked at the case and said, well, where's your proof that the food was the problem? If you don't have the proof, again, the burden of proof is on the plaintiff. If, if on the other hand, the FDA comes out and says, we found this toxic material in the food and we believe that this was the source of the issue then there is substantive proof that can support a class action so it's a matter of getting the sequence right Let's put this all into perspective with the pet food consumer what are their responsibilities? What should they do? I have to go back a little bit. Just a couple of days ago, reports of other brands that had nothing to do with Purina, yes, other manufacturers course. listed. So I assume this is where the FDA has to kind of go around to see what the, those components are that they all are using, like the synthetic vitamin packs or the same sourcing for the meats. This can take years to yeah, figure this, this is number one. Let, let me say this about the other brands that have come up. There's been quite a range of stuff, including yes. things like um, Stella and Chewy's was mentioned. Right. Which is, which is a raw food. As well, they have, they have dry food too. They have kibble as well. Yeah. But Thank you. Um, the, the number one thing that uh, consumers should do never throw out the, the packaging or if you're going to throw out the packaging make a note somewhere of the brand that you're feeding the variety you're feeding the lot number the expiry date all that basic information before you dump the food into a large container for storage take all a picture of that information take, take a, a picture. picture paper write it down or take a picture stick it on the side of your bin so that you know what's in that bin so that if you find that your pet is getting sick after eating that food, when, and you notice I say, when you call the FDA, you will have that basic information to give them. 
So that's easy. step one that every consumer should do, and that's easy to do. And when you've finished that particular bag of food and you're switching to a different batch number or whatever, throw out that picture or that piece of paper and write down the new one. Just keep track. Someone commented on one of my posts that a lot of stores will track customers' purchases and will be able, if the customer gets back in touch with them, to tell them what variety and batch they purchase, because that's part of the, the store's inventory process. Well, the, the store doesn't necessarily see the batch. They no. put the stuff on the shelves, but they, they, don't, they don't keep track of the batch. The large, the large chains, I'm, I'm thinking of places like Costco, for example. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Of course. If there's, re, if there's a recall of a product that Costco sells, they alert their customers who purchased that product. And they'll alert them that batch number so-and-so was recalled. The Petco Pet it's Smart do the same thing? Be or the, the independent pets don't necessarily independent, do The independent stores don't necessarily do that. Costco, yes, I see that, of course. But you have plenty of people just buying from them from the independents, from Petco Pet Smart, buying from Amazon. Right. They can go back to Amazon and say, hey, I got this from this reseller who got it from another reseller who had the product sitting in their they're garage. Not six be, years. They're not going to be able to track back. No. So number one for the consumer, always keep track of exactly what you're feeding at any given time. Number yeah. two, do not hesitate to file a complaint with the FDA. If the complaint turns out not to have any validity, if you're the only one who's filed a complaint and nothing else comes in to support it, no harm done, but you might be the key person who gives them the key clue to unraveling a problem. So even if you know that 300 other people have filed, you should as well. You should as well. Do you think there's resistance in filing? I think there's confusion in filing. I've, I've literally had to walk a couple of people step by step through the process of how to file because people are intimidated about just going onto the website and figuring out where to go. It's not a difficult process, but it does take a bit of time and it does take a little bit of effort. So there's, there's resistance to just sitting down and doing it until you get to the point where you in the immortal words of the movie network, say, I'm as mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. And you, the, that one person could be the one that shifts that one the whole investigation. So think, everyone matters. I think back to the Avengers Pentabartital. Mm -hmm. If that family had not filed a complaint, no telling how much longer it would have taken before that problem was found. I think back to the first um, major Darwin's episode of a few years ago, mm -hmm. and one person who had contacted me and I convinced her to file a complaint, her German shepherd was very sick. Right. She filed the complaint, the FDA came out, picked up the residual food, found the salmonella in it, the FDA paid for follow-up salmonella testings on her dog, found the salmonella, did a match. She was the key on that Darwin's one complainant. So any one person, this, this person in Texas who got in touch with, uh, with the FDA about the Purina and who has the leftover food and has, who is going to be or has already supplied it to the FDA, she might turn out to be the key person who, who has that critical piece of information that will get the, the problem rolling. So, so even if you, everything matters. Every, every single complaint matters. If for no other reason than it helps form the pattern, the more information the FDA has on the range of varieties, on the range of batch codes and ex expiration dates, the better it's situated to determine the scope of the problem. Is there a place that any consumer can go and get directions on how to do this? I have, I have something on my site 
if they go to efoodalert.com, I've put up a menu item along the top row and it's called Nestle Purina Pet Care. If they click on that menu item, they'll see all my posts and they'll also see the directions for filing the complaint with the FDA. I've got a direct link there to the page that gives the, the phone numbers for all of the consumer complaint coordinators. There's w at least one for every state. Mm -hmm. And I've got a direct link for the page if they prefer to file a complaint online. There's a process, a step-by-step -step, uh, question and answer and fill in form. It extends over a few pages. It's a little bit time consuming, but on the other hand, you don't have to start waiting on hold on a phone call. So right. either way, either report will get equal attention from the FDA, either way of filing. Right. A lot of pet owners are going right to the manufacturer and filing a complaint. What do you say about that? I see no harm in filing a complaint with the company. If nothing else, it helps the company realize how upset consumers are. But do not give the company all your leftover food. Why not? Because the company may or may not bother testing it. They might simply do a visual examination. Oh, no worms or insects here. It's okay. They might just test it for maybe for salmonella, maybe for something else. They, they're not necessarily going to do the kind of investigative testing to find the source of the problem. It depends on the attitude of the company. What uh, do you think of Purina's attitude? I think I would much rather see consumers have the FDA do the testing. That says a lot. I do know that a couple of consumers have paid to have third-party labs do the testing. I do not know, and, and again, having worked in the industry for a lot of years in the US, there are labs and there are labs, and not every lab is equally good at doing everything. The FDA has a network of labs that form what it calls the the Vet Learn Network, which stands for Veterinary Laboratory Investigation and Response Network. And these are mostly labs that are either associated with state departments of agriculture or with universities that have very strong food and, and animal health departments, such as Michigan State University is one of them. University of California, Davis is one of them. And they have a cooperating lab in Canada at the University of Guelph, which is the top food safety and animal health university in Canada. Guelph was the university that figured out the melamine issue. Can consumers from here send the products there as well and have them tested by Guelph? I honestly don't know. I would imagine so. Okay. Uh, if they... If the consumer submits the sample directly to a lab, the consumer pays. Of course. If the consumer has submits a sample to the FDA, if the FDA accepts a sample from the consumer as part of its investigation, the FDA pays. And when you're talking about a situation where you're not quite sure what you're looking for, these mm -hmm. tests easily will run into hundreds of dollars. So it becomes a very expensive proposition for a consumer to do this themselves, if you can afford it. That's the issue. It's, 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 a, it's a stretch for a lot of people. It is a stretch. You have all this information on your site. I will have all the links in the show notes where pet owners, pet retailers, if you're concerned, you can get all this information and have it in your stores. So if anyone comes with questions, you can just pass along this information or put it on your store information page. You could take it from my site or go to eFoodAlert.com, fill us the site and get all this information. I think it's important for all of us to share it so we know what's happening. Because yeah, my worry is all these other foods that were reported, what else is going to be touched? 
we had pill science diet with the excess vitamin D. Is this a supplement pack issue? Are many other brands going to be touched? We just don't know. The more information out there, the better. By the way, I did call Merrick, who is owned by Purina, and they said that they have nothing to do with Purina. I said, wait, wait, what do you mean? They're your parent company. And they said, no, but we have nothing to do with this. We're not affected. We're a natural pet food company. And I said, should consumers who are buying your foods be concerned? So she had to switch me some to another person. And I went into a voicemail. I didn't leave a message. But there's a lot of avoidance. And I'm, I worry about the pet food consumer, if they're being hit in the face with this avoidance from the manufacturer, go to the FDA, report it to the FDA. If you have questions, go to the consumer sites like Saving Pets, at least uh, put your grievances there, uh, talk about it there. Maybe you can get better direction because it seems like the brands don't have to do anything until they have to. And that's a really lousy way of doing business. I'm keeping a close eye on whatever comes out. I'm hoping that FDA will have something in the way of news and update information sooner rather than later. And I will be posting whatever information I get. All I can say, if you're a consumer, if I was feeding a Purina product, I would stop right now if I was feeding it. And for the retailers that are carrying Purina, what would you say to them? That's kind of difficult. I, I have seen reports that a couple of re retailers have on their own hook removed the bags of Purina from their shelves and have just warehoused them temporarily. I, I don't really feel comfortable telling them what to do. I, mm -hmm. What would you suggest? I, I would not feel comfortable selling the product if I was a retailer at this point. Is that all the brands from Purina, even though Merrick says they have nothing to do with Purina, but is that all the brands that Purina owns? I, I haven't looked at uh, Merrick specifically. Not all of the brands are produced in all of the in all of the production facilities. Right. So, and and I have not checked to see whether Merrick is produced in the same geographic facility as the Pro Plan. Some of the facilities just produce one or two brands. Others produce four or five brands. And and I found this on the Nestle of all of all the places. I found it on the Nestle job site. Hmm. Where. <laughs> where they indicate which brands they're selling, with the different manufacturing locations across the country and which ones are producing the different kinds of products. So you'd, you'd sort of have to go and see, okay, where is the merit being produced? And, and I have not done that. Um, I would likely try to avoid the brands that are produced in the same location or locations as the Purina Pro Plan for the do time. You know, do you know which one, which facilities those are? Uh, off the top of my head, let me see if I have that. I was looking at that, um, and I have actually FOIA'd, I've sent in Freedom of Information Act requests on uh, some of these facilities just to see what the previous inspections had to say. Yeah, I was just going to ask you about that. Uh, let me see. Because wasn't there a recall on their prescription diet in the there last was year as well? Recall last February, so coming up on a year ago. Right. On their uh, on their diet because of a vitamin D issue, excess vitamin D. Now the facilities that produce ProPlan are in Clinton, Iowa. Crete, Nebraska, Denver, Colorado, Edmond, Oklahoma, and Flagstaff, Arizona. Those are the ones I found that I've a lot of facilities. requests on. The I I can't tell you for sure, but I think that the product last year that had the vitamin D issue 
I think that was produced in the Clinton, Iowa facility. And the reason I'm saying that is that the FDA did an inspection of that plant around that time. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the FDA didn't post its findings. It was an inspection that was rated voluntary action indicated, which means they found one or more issues that had to be corrected. And usually the FDA will summarize what those issues are on their inspection database site. Unfortunately, they didn't with that particular inspection. So I'll have to wait for the uh, results oh, yeah. of the request to come in. But that's the only plant that was inspected around that time. So I hmm. suspect that was where the vitamin D issue originated. And if there are other brands that wind up being factors and causing symptoms, not, not having to do with Purina, how would, how would the FDA look at the whole picture? I think that what they would do initially, and again, this is just my yes. And I'll tell you, the reason why I'm asking is because people will not do anything until there's an actual recall. So yeah. they want to hear from the government, even though the government and is what so when People have to submit complaints. If, if the FDA starts to see a number of complaints about one of the other brands, Merrick, Beneful, Stella's, whichever, mm -hmm. and they start to see, again, a pattern, they will investigate. They can't, they can't work on what they don't officially know about. It is vital to submit these reports. What are they going to do if there's a bigger issue with other brands? Uh, they will probably, and again, depending on the nature of the issue, depending on the level of cooperation of the companies, depending on how they track back, they will probably do the same sort of thing that they did on the food side with the applesauce. They will issue a public advisory. They will say, we have found whatever they have found. These are the brands that are affected. This is what we've found. This is what we are still in the process of investigating. Be aware, these are the recalls that may or may not have been made to this point. And they will, they will put out that and they will update it periodically if it's, if it's a larger issue, just as they did with the jerky treats, just as they did with the DCM issue, mm -hmm. where they said, we have been receiving these reports of illnesses. It seems to correlate to these particular types of pet foods. Be aware of this. We are investigating and so forth. They okay. will, once, once they have the information to share, they will share it. There's a lot of work left to be done. There is an awful lot of work left to be done. And the critical key here is the consumer. Absolutely. I've been a food safety advocate for more years than I care to remember. I have been involved in food safety for half a century. Ever since I got out of school, I've been one way or another involved in food safety, either mm -hmm. on the government side or the industry side or as an advocate. And it never seems to get any better. Mm -hmm. Has it gotten worse? Uh, to some extent, I think it has because industry has continued to grow and the regulatory bodies have continued to shrink. And so how do you enforce a speed limit if you don't have enough cops with radar guns? True. That's where the pet consumer uh, advocates come in to pinpoint these trends so that you as the pet owner can have an awareness to, to be able to make better choices for your pets and the, and the food you buy. Thanks for doing this today. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much for inviting me. I, we just need to do everything we can to keep public awareness up on this. And hopefully, hopefully we'll be able to report that there is a solution.